Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, my next guest is uh, the Right Honourable Winston Peters, educated at Wangarei Boys High School, Dargaville High School, has a BA in History and Political Studies, LLB in Auckland, has two children, a son and a daughter, uh, and we've just been discussing a brown Labrador named Bo that doesn't behave. Um, former teacher, a barrister and solicitor in his own law practice, former captain of the Auckland Māori rugby team, played for the Auckland University Seniors, maintains an interest in sport, fishing and reading, first entered Parliament uh, as the National Party MP for Hunua in 1978, set up the New Zealand First Party in 1993. Um, and, uh, as we know, in 2008, fell just below the 5% threshold. Persistent paid off with 8 MPs back in Parliament in 2011. Mr Peters, it's great to have you here. We really appreciate you taking your time. Perhaps we can just get straight into it and uh, start off with the issue of marriage. New Zealand First was the one party in Parliament that actually voted against uh, same-sex marriage and redefining it. Was, was the opposition to redefining it on the basis that you thought it should go to referendum, or were you in principle opposed to redefining it? Uh, we're opposed to temporary uh, empowered politicians making these critical decisions on behalf of society, and we far more trust the people of this country, and that's why we said we will not uh, let you pass this law unless you, first of all, put it to the people of New Zealand to see that they consent. That was our position, and we stuck with it. <clears throat> For you personally, would you have voted for it? No, again, my position was, our position was what we collectively agreed upon, but it happened to be, happily for me, my position as well. So you would accept the, um, the view of the public? If the public had said we support it, you would have voted through the bill? Well, I'm not prepared that. to accept the, the temporary, as I say, the, the view of temporarily empowered, never to last long politicians. I far trust, more trust the public on these matters. And, you know, I've seen over my time what you might call activist uh, MPs who arrive in Parliament uh, determined to right society as they see it. Now, I'm very suspicious of that sort of person. Personally, though, do you agree with yeah, redefining marriage? I'm very marriage? suspicious of them, yeah. No. Do you... <laughs> <laughs> You're being very political here. It's very good. I'm not being political. I'm, the, I'm giving the plain, unvarnished fact. Well, can, can, I, can I be blunt? Do you support marriage as being defined as one man, one woman? Well, of course I do. Always do you, have. Do you support it being redefined as something else or including something else? No, I, I, I support the position that the public should decide this matter and it has not been put to them. Okay, but what about and you? It's still our position. But you personally? Well, I don't get your point. Huh? Do you support I, marriage? My, I, I gave my first answer, which was yes. You support now, now marriage being one man, one woman? That's right. If, if a bill is introduced to redefine it, to allow group marriage, polygamy... Well, of course I'd oppose that. But, uh, you know, you're dependent upon a collective environment. Now, the only way you can control that is by saying, why don't you all have the uh, democratic initiative to trust the people on that matter? And that's the only way you can somehow control that political environment if you force them on a position of morality to first consult the people. Otherwise, you left one lone voice and you're still going to lose the argument, aren't you? But if you can put it on a different plane, like why aren't you prepared to trust the people, you might win that argument, then you might have a referendum, and that you'll have to live with. Yeah, I mean, let's touch on referendums, because do you think that referendums are always the best track to go down? I think the state of Colorado are realising that a referendum on decriminalising marijuana uh, may not have been the greatest decision they ever made. So can we always trust referendums? I know what you're saying. Uh, and let me put it this way. If uh, this country was to, in a referendum, decide to go uh, nuclear capable, I'd resign from Parliament. That doesn't mean I don't respect the people's wishes, but I wouldn't be prepared to govern in that circumstance. So if you are able to introduce binding referendums, and that would include citizens initiated Binding referendums, I assume, not just government referendums? Well, I think the system should always be, and it was set up under the, uh, under the electoral changes and electoral reform for referenda, but it's been always been my view that a smart or wise government would frequently use referenda to determine the people's view. And I was the person that put a compulsory savings regime to the people of this country in 1997 when I was Deputy Prime Minister. 
Now, I got smashed <laughs> on the question of compulsory savings. Or, to put it this way, the people voted me down, but boy, they didn't vote away the problem, did they? And I bet, I bet that now they wish they had it done, because we would be so much more independent of foreign money now. So if New Zealand First was able to introduce binding referendum, would, would there be any threshold? Would it still be 10 per cent of uh, voters signing a petition, still a 50 per cent pass mark? What, when, do, when does it become binding? Well, let me tell you about the 10 per cent. I think the 10 per cent threshold is too high because it's too much work and too much cost to get a referendum up. And what happened was, and I was there at the time in the National Party when we put together the 1990 electoral reform policy of the party, and those who were opposed to the idea of referenda went straight for 10 per cent because they thought they could squeeze out the possibility of referenda happening. What I'm saying was I went through, lived through it, but don't forget it was, and I'm not being boastful here, but you will not find any colleague in New Zealand First, our National Party disputing that I was the cause for the reform policy in the first place in 1990. That's why we got referenda. So if you're in a position to bargain after the election, is referendum, binding referendum a bottom line for you? Well, yes, it is. In this context, uh, we had the Robinson referenda on the size of parliament. Uh, you had uh, the referenda with respect to uh, law, and law and order. All these things have been just ignored, and it's not our, poli it's not our party's policy to do that. We want uh, referenda to be respectable, and that uh, when they are held, it should be pre-stated that this will be binding on parliament. Just back to the issue of uh, marriage, the, we've learned earlier that the marriage rate is constantly dropping, uh, that there's increase in de facto and, and um, broken families. Does that concern you? Do you think uh, government should be promoting uh, marriage, talking about marriage? I mean, the only time politicians seem to talk about it is when they want to redefine it. Do, do you think we should talk more about marriage and structure and promote it? Well, let's face it, uh, that this has caused huge destabilisation in a whole lot of areas. Uh, not just to do with uh, the outfall with, for society, but in housing, uh, in finance matters, in all sorts of uh, ramifications. And you would have thought that the finance industry itself and the housing industry itself and others would have been arguing for this because it is a better way of uh, combining money to acquire a house in the first place. And it's an easier way to keep it as well. So yes, there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, being the case, but it, you know, uh, you're sort of asking me the obvious. Down through history, it is the institution that has kept uh, communities and countries together. So, should uh, do you have any ideas of how government could work it better? I mean, I used the example this morning of, for example, the Australian government and also I think the Cameron government in the UK have been offering, uh, for example, pre-marriage counselling vouchers, support for families. Um, you know, there's a suggestion of income splitting, allowing parents, one parent to stay at home with very young children. Is that something you would go down the road of, promoting? Well, well look, we'd look at any series of initiatives that would that look like they are practical, and practical is the word we emphasise because far too much policy is decided inside the beltway by people who are far too removed, are far too removed from the societal reality itself, and some of their solutions just uh, are actually mind-boggling. So uh, if you say yes, that you've got a series of practical measures here, we would be extraordinarily open-minded in looking at it. Do you think you, you will see um, a bill to introduce polygamy and group marriage at some stage soon? Especially with, for example, some of the uh, cultures that are coming into the country where it is the norm in their country? Well, uh, well that's, how, that's one of the reasons why we are so strong on unfocused, unplanned immigration. We want people here because we need them and are prepared to respect our flag, respect our traditions, respect our values, respect our laws. That's not happening in a lot of cases at the moment. Uh, and so if somebody wanted to waltz in here and started pushing polygamy, uh, the answer would be, well, actually, you should go back to where you come from. We don't like that. The anti-smacking uh, law... I, I just want to make this oh, yeah. point. When you say, do you think somebody in power might do that? Well. Let's be honest, uh, if you look at some parliamentarians, they're living proof that New Zealanders can take a joke. Now, that's what you've got to deal with. Okay. <laughs> um, the anti-smacking law was actually passed when you were a senior member of parliament. I think you were the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs yes. uh, in the Clark government. Yes. How, did, how did that law actually get through? What happened was that the, in 19, sorry, 2005, when it became patently obvious to us that if we were to be in any arrangement, 
we only had one choice, and that was the Labour Party, because the other parties were Māori Party, based on race, and you know what my party feels about that. We are for one franchise, one law for everybody. We're the originators of that. We have been the people who have argued for that through thick and through thin, and on the Marae everywhere, and we've defended it. And so you had the Māori Party, you had the ACT Party, the United Party, and uh, I forget some other party, and the National Party, and us, that's five. And I thought, this is impossible. This is a device where within four months, the National Party will be calling a snap election going for broke. And I wasn't going to get sucked into that. And so when the Labour Party came to us, we said, well, if you're going to have any more social revolution policy, don't bother talking to us. And by the way, I did say, if you're talking to the Greens, don't talk to us either. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I said. Now, when you ask that question, you see, when the uh, legislation that you talk about came, it came from a Green member, not Labor. So here we go, Labor then is not being caught by our arrangement. And the real point was, though, that the National Party and the Labor Party got together and backed that legislation. We voted against it. We voted against it then, we would voted against it now, because the brutalization of youth has got far worse than then. It has not worked, and we are uh, very happy to defend our position anywhere. So can I just confirm the policy, which was what we communicated in 2011? You said the policy for New Zealand First is to repeal the anti-smacking law. Uh, accordingly, we will not enter any coalition or confidence and supply agreement with a party that wishes to ignore the public's clearly stated view in a referendum on that issue. Well, remember in 2011, on the 6th of uh, um, October in 2011, we made a statement out at Kelston saying, we are not going with any side, their policies are too far removed from ours. So I was able to give that undertaking because we were working towards the view that we could not go with Labour or National. Uh, some of the, of the other parties' policies on the economy were, we thought, dangerous and some of the other parties' policies on social policy was extremely dangerous, and so we made that stand. But our, that view now is, our view now is that the public ought to be brought up to date on how uh, much of a failure that legislation is. The brutalisation of children has gone far worse, and it, the legislation primarily back then set out to attack the wrong person. That's what happened. That's, that is, that is still our view, but we are 11, months, 11 weeks away from the election and we are not going to get caught with bottom lines at this, at this early out. I don't know what the shape of New Zealand politics will be the next 11 months. Uh, you will know well before the election where we stand, but this far out, we do not want to be laying out uh, or giving up our uh, strategies uh, to anybody this early. But how important is this changing this law to you? Is it up there? Well, it's important for us to make a stand back then, and a stand we did make. When you, when you refer to uh, the referendum, are you talking about the 87% referendum that's been held, or, or are you saying that's we'll introduce binding referendum? That is the referendum we, uh, that we still respect. It is still, for example, our position on the Robinson referendum as well. We think that, we, that we do not need more than 100 members of parliament. That's still our position. Uh, so when you put the question to me, uh, I've sort of somewhat le uh, taken aback because you're suggesting that we change our policies when it suits us. No, we don't. Good. We've stuck on these policies, on things like alcohol, on uh, liberalisation, all these other matters, rock solid for 21 years. And we're the only party that's got that record. That's a nice segue into our next issue, which is the drinking age. You voted yes both times to raise the drinking age. That's right. Um, did you think the split age was a possibility? It no, I thought it was a nonsense, and more importantly, back when it first happened, you recall, uh, the majority of young people between 18 and 20 thought it should be a stay at 20. Mm. They ignored them as well. Mm. They ignored them, they ignored the police, they ignored everybody. And you've got all these disasters out in our society today, all made because of parliamentarians deciding that they would go, look, they'd go along with the liquor industry. But you look at our record, we have never voted for the liberality of liquor ever. So uh, do you agree with the five plus solution that the uh, community groups and anti-alcohol groups have put up of restricting the availability, increasing the price, 
Um, uh, look, let me, let me, you, that's a very good question, but let me tell you this. Um, so we're voting on number two, that's why I went to the bottom of the page. <laughs> <laughs> I've provided the questions to all the leaders <laughs> I, and I, 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 I offered to provide the answers as well. <laughs> all right. All right, let me, let, me do, let me say this. We have always opposed greater accessibility. We have always opposed advertising. We have always opposed drink driving. Uh, and we have always opposed and we've always supported increased treatment. That's your four, okay? Yeah. But if a product is lawful, I do not think that poor people and poor families should be paying an unaffordable cost for something that's legal. And all I see when I see that fifth uh, limb of your plan Raise price. is to give the um, Treasury and the Minister of Finance a further cause to just take the money and do nothing about the problem. Part of the problem, though, is that uh, it's so cheap. I mean, you can go into supermarkets and uh, it's sometimes cheaper than the, the fizzy drink or the cordial, and it's right there as you walk in, and it's, you know, rock bottom prices. I mean, when I look at supermarket special pamphlets, always on the front page is alcohol. It's a, it's a lost leader. I think the industry realised that alcohol is a great lost leader. It attracts people into their supermarket with a great price on booze. So yeah, that's but, part of the yeah, argument. Yeah, for price. but you're talking about accessibility and availability, all those matters. Yeah. You know where we stand. But I look around a lot of poor families in this country, and there are, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of poor now. And I do not want to impose any extra cost that may impinge on their children and their family budget, or their weekly budget. I know what you're going to say, but if a, it becomes a cost of $200 over there on liquor or $100. I know which one leaves more for the children in the family, and I'm against I'm against uh, the uh, constant uh, trend of governments to say, "Here's my legitimate reason for putting on this tax," and yet they never apply the money towards it. Would that be? Would you apply that also to the tobacco issue? Well, likewise. I mean, I could buy if you were in uh, most of South America a packet of cigarettes for about two two bucks. Here it's costing twenty dollars. And the government's taking it, putting it in its back pocket, not doing a thing about it. If you see what I mean here now, I know what looks superficially attractive, but when you look at it, if that means some poor kid's going starving, I think uh, on that one issue of price, I don't agree. And it's a freedom issue as well. One, one of the arguments against alcohol, of course, is that uh, a child is hugely at risk when there's an alcoholic in the home, when there's alcohol, alcohol abuse. Yeah, there's no, but there's no doubt about that. But you put the price up, you'll still have that. That's my point. Okay. You know. Euthanasia is an interesting one because um, for decriminalising euthanasia, you did support um, Peter Brown's bill, but only to the first reading. Is that correct? Look, Peter Brown's first wife died in tragic circumstances, enormous pain, and he was very sensitive about it. And he said to me, I'd like to be able to put a bill up to Parliament. And I said, well, we're a, a party that believes in MPs having a conscience and having a sense of freedom. We'll allow you to put it to the public to decide, like for public submissions, but you do not get our support past the first reading. You're on your own after that. Okay, so Marion Street is going to put up a bill next year after the election, so she says. Will you support that? No, I won't support that bill. That matter should go to the public of this country after a decent, informed debate. So just back to referendums, on what issues would you push an issue to a referendum? Is it conscience vote type things, moral issues? On conscience issues, yes. So anything that's deemed a conscience issue, although right. as we've found a lot of conscience issues have become party issues, like the smacking bill. No, no, what, what happened was that, that in this case, the National Party and Labour Party conspired together to negative the damage to each other by going together with the same policy. They plotted behind the public's back. It's mm. not the first time. Okay. They did it also on the question of the size of Parliament. Remember, here comes the Robinson petition to reduce the size of Parliament. Helen Clark says, well, I wouldn't respect it if they do pass it, if they do get the majority. And the National Party didn't say a word. Why Instead of saying, we will. Why do politicians hate referendums so much? Uh, because they don't want to give up power. Is that clean? Uh, adoption. I'd better go in order now, because you're following my question line. <laughs> Well, I, Which is a real well, pain. Well, I, did, <laughs> well I, I did take the time to study it very carefully. I'm, I'm pleased. And as you see, I can give you my answers now. Green, <laughs> Green MP uh, Kevin Haig, he wants um, to allow same-sex adoption 
to any couple, same sex, even if they're not married. Uh, and yet some people would argue that if a, if a child is awarded the state and we're adopting them into a family, uh, little Katie deserves a mum as much as she deserves a dad. A child is entitled to a mum and a dad. Do you agree with that? Well, the answer to your question was, do you support what uh, Mr. Haig is arguing for? And the answer is no. Look, your second question was, do you think where mum and dad should be there where possible? The answer is, of course they should be. Right, moving on. Uh, over the page. Uh, <laughs> so over the page, <laughs> We're up to parental notification. <laughs> Will you, uh, do you support, basically, parents being told if their teenager is pregnant and is considering an abortion? Do you think parents have the right to know unless there are exceptional circumstances which can be argued through the court? If that girl is in the, the parent's care, that is legally in the parent's care, the answer is yes. Simple, so simple as that. Simple as that. Is, is there a private member's bill coming out of New Zealand First to fix that? Because it's dragged on for a lot of the well, members. Uh, well, look, we've got eight members, we've got seven members' bills up now. Mm. That is, we've got a lot of bills waiting, trying to get them in the ballot paper. Uh, so if you ask me the question, have we got such a bill ready? No. Mm. But that's the first time anybody's asked us. Okay, Amongst well, other things. I'll keep asking. Uh, <laughs> well, well, but hang on, we've got some serious bills that, on big issues uh, about the unfairness of society, the unfairness of our economic policy. Issues to do with who owns this country and the land and the farms and what have you. So, I mean, I'm not saying that your issue is not important, but what we have got waiting in the ballot box are very important issues as well. That's what I'm saying. Let's talk about um, abortion. There appears to be a, a clash in the minds of New Zealanders of whether a, a woman has a right to an abortion or an unborn child has a right to life. Um, which side do you come, on down, come down on? Our position has never changed, nor has mine, since I've been a politician. <coughs> if we are to have abortions, they should be safe, they should be legal, and they should be rare. That's where this party stands. So, so do you support the Greens' policy of decriminalising abortion? No, we don't. But you've just argued that they should be legal. So. No, no, no. If it happens, our position is, they should be s safe. Yeah. They should be legal and they should be rare. So legal within the guidelines that are in That's the... That's right. right. And don't forget, I emphasise the word rare. That's not what's happening now, as you well know. Mm. The Greens want open uh, uh, no rules at all. The Greens are not just saying we want to make uh, abortions uh, legal. As you well know, they are now. They want total removal of all restrictions uh, on this issue. So... Um so you'll oppose the decriminalisation. What about uh, in terms of, for example, gender selection, a Down syndrome, uh, where there's abnormalities? I mean, the Greens policy suggests that right up until 40 weeks, a child with abnormalities... Look, uh, let me tell you about this, this here. The Greens have never been in political power since they began in the name and the shape and the title of the Values Party in 1972. They've been around a long time and have never made it, and I don't want to be on a stage wasting my time talking about a party that's never made it. Can we just go back to that? <laughs> well, now this, 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 interview, this, this interview is about a party that has made it, and is going to make it big time in 2014. So, the Gre the Gre uh, well, that, there's another party that, that reckons that, that um, a child at 19 weeks is... A, is entitled to be aborted, but at 20 weeks you shouldn't abort it. When do, when do, for you personally, when do you think life begins? When does an child, unborn child have a right to life? At what point in their life? Well, you're speaking biologically. Life begins from the very start. Conception. Yeah. Well, it, isn't it curious? If it was the royal family and the day we all knew as a, uh, members of the Commonwealth, uh, we'd begin, we'd, we'd think there is a baby. It's going to be an heir to the throne, right? Mm -hmm. Now, look at that concept as opposed to what people say in other circumstances. Mm -hmm. So my answer is, from the beginning. Decriminalisation of marijuana? Our policy has always been, to, and I've told these people out there in the meetings that they have, listen, you guys, we're going to give you a two-year debate and then a referendum, and you're going to have to live with the results. And so let's go back to Colorado. They had the referendum. I personally think they completely botched it up because they listened to sound bites and they heard 
a few stories of people who needed medicinal marijuana, but they didn't understand the whole concept of it. Well, you know, uh, as, a greater admirer, as great an admirer of America as I am, America has some serious dysfunctionality in many parts of it. <laughs> so, it <laughs> so, so, sorry, just to clarify, for marijuana you're saying if a bill comes forward to decriminalise it, you'll only support it if there is a referendum on the issue? That's right. Okay. You personally, do you think it's a wise thing for New Zealand to decriminalise marijuana? No, personally, I've seen it deter terrible damage where marijuana was the start out drug and they've graduated to worse drugs. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a cancer and on, on our society, it's devastating in the extreme. But you're asking me what can best get some control of this drive to liberality, and the only thing that can get control is if the public of this country gets to have the say so that politicians cannot carry on doing what they like. Uh, you oppose decriminalisation of prostitution. You we still stand by that? We, of course I stand by it. Why would I change my mind? I, <laughs> I mean, well, it's a disaster out here. You've got people plying the streets, neighbourhoods being terrorised by all sorts of behaviour, or, or the obscenities in the, in the streets of this country. And the contempt for, for that uh, was demonstrated by parliamentarians. They showed how little they knew about this issue. They went ahead and passed the law. And look at the consequences now. And mainly poor communities are putting up with it. There's a, there's a bill before Parliament uh, to ban street prostitution put up by Auckland Council. It's, it's dragging through Parliament. Do you know why? Yes, it's dragging through Parliament because the people in Parliament who uh, uh, supported this law, and it's amazing that, if you go back and look at who supported it, uh, they don't want, wish to address the issue. Uh, they are not concerned about the Hunter's Corners in South Auckland and all that sort of disaster. Uh, mm. And uh, they are dragging the, they're dragging the chain because it embarrasses them to have been disclosed, uh, to have to be revealed just how naive and uh, liberal they were on this issue. So your MP, Asanate Lolo Taylor, she has a private member's bill to yes, ban street it. prostitution. That's right. Uh, to ban residential brothels? I don't think it includes that, does it? I think her bill addressed the problem <coughs> in uh, South Auckland, as she saw it, mm. and it, it's to uh, it's street prostitution. Mm. Um, but we were never or never uh, supportive of these changes. Child, youth and family. Um, we've been calling for a long time for an independent child, youth and family complaints authority. I don't know about you, but Every week I'm getting cases of families who feel that either SIFs have overstepped the mark or they haven't acted where they should have. Do you think there should be an independent watchdog similar to the police? Uh, I believe so, yes. Uh, I think it's essential. There's too much going on. But just, just one, one caution. I know that SIFs is frequently uh, criticised for incompetence, but you have to admit that there's been a serious degradation of our society, which is inexplicable given our climate, our space, our room, and sort of the, the wonderful environment to live in, a lot of what's happening in our country is just inexplicable for our, for our type of society. And they have a hard job to do. That said, I think far too many times they have proved to have been less than competent in what they did. So I'm just going to divert slightly from the question line here and just ask you a, a more philosophical question. What do you put down as being some of the key factors leading to that degradation. Why, why are those social statistics getting worse and worse? Well, the confusion between liberty and license. That's been a, a serious conf confusion in, in my, from my young life uh, where the, the, uh, social, the so-called social engineers painted liberty and freedom when but what they were advocating was license itself. And wise societies have always understood the difference between those two things. The second thing is, what consequences do you want when you, for example, stop schools being able to punish children, stop parents to be able, uh, from being able to punish children? What you get now is all sorts of people, even at the highest academic level university, who've got no respect for law and order, no respect for society or anybody, frankly, and particularly when they get, on the, when they get a few drinks in them. And so all that dysfunctionality is not an accident. It happens by, because of careless, negligent planning on the way through. And, and why is it that the politicians can't see that? I mean, it seems like that is a common sense response. People agree with it. Well, one of the reasons is that of all the professions there are in the world, the only one where you don't have any qualifications or training at all is to be in politics. 
Mass Effect. <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> At the, at the moment, um, the government pours into over a billion dollars every year into childcare. Um, there's childcare centres being built left, right and centre. Some people would argue, look, if the money's going towards professionals to look after kids, why shouldn't it also be directed towards families where, where one of the parents chooses to stay home and look after those kids during those early formative years? Well, look, I, I see your point, and, uh, and you did have around that question, I think it was, you asked uh, whether we, we believed in the, uh, the 26 weeks. To pay parental leave. Yes, yes that's coming that is, Yes, we do. Uh, um, but on this other issue, uh, this country is not an, a successful economy. Contrary to what the government is saying, we are not performing in any way, shape or form the way we did uh, in the 50s, 60s, in the 40s, 50s and 60s, where we were breaking 4 to 5 percent growth every year, year upon year after year, and we made ourselves the second highest per capita country in the world. Now we're broke. Uh, we're, I'm told we're living in a rock star economy, and the world's fantastic, but it's not. Uh, there is serious poverty creeping into what you call the middle class now, where they've got no spare money at all, and the government's strapped for cash as well. So whilst I think that that is uh, uh, an idea that's worth looking at, I don't know whether we've got the money for that now. And a lot of politicians will get up on the stage and tell you what they're going to do, but they were never the treasurer of this country, and I was. And I know how, how hard it is to get a surplus. So, so that actually... Uh, by the way, I did get one every year too. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, I haven't got this question on your sheet, so apologies for that, but I led into this question with the Prime Minister earlier because it was a theme of his book that's just been released. And that is that... Um, is there an issue, do you think, of growing inequality in New Zealand? We hear this catch cry of growing child poverty, growing inequality. Do you think there is? Well, you ask the question twice, you get one answer, uh, because I'm sure he didn't answer the question for you. Is there growing inequality in this country? Dramatically so. Uh, we have abandoned being the great society we once were, where we were the world leader because we had the, highest, the second highest per capita earnings in the world, but we had the greatest spread of wealth in the world by any economy. And we were a model where political scientists were coming and getting off boats in those days to come and study a society that should not be possible. And where the Minister of Labour, uh, not because he had a photographic memory, but he could remember every, and he knew the name of every unemployed person that was registered, because there were only 29. <laughs> not 100, not 1,000, just 29, right from Kinbekagel to Kaitaia. Now, we have changed from being that. We've become an egregious self-centred society in large measure and cultivated by the advent of Rogernomics in 1984 and then Ruthenomics in 1990, the same brand, which was uh, designed to uh, move the wealth out of the hands of the many to the very few. And the trend of the United States, where enormous wealth is in the hands of minimal number of people and the UK, has happened here to a slightly lesser extent, but it seriously has happened. And so, for example, uh, breakfast in schools, 1.9 million. Sorry, 1.9 million is what they've given to breakfast in schools. That's about a third of what they were paying the guy to run telecom. It's outrageous. So in that context, yes, there's huge inequality creeping into our country, and some of it is malignant to the extent you cannot see them getting out of it. Now, I'm from a poor family, of 11 children. The first members of my family lived in a tent. So I know something about what poverty smells, tastes and feels like. But we were under a series of great governments with leaders of great vision back then. And we took that family from poverty to you know, serious advantage and choice. Uh, we ate, uh, went to university uh, and uh, did, did their lunch and uh, made a career for themselves. And also the luck of that great society was that in that family of four generations, the only two people who have died were a mother at 97 years of age and my father at 85 years of age, and only because he was too stubborn to go to hospital. <laughs> now, that society that a poor family lived through, and four generations, just two people died. All the rest got housing, education, employment and opportunity, and have never been on the dole. So, I want that society back again, and it's not that I'm nostalgic, I know what our country can do, 
but it will not do it with this economic and social prescription now. And so what is your solution? Well, our solution you will see in our manifesto. We set out, and we've argued for a long time about the economic and social policies that are required. And you might say, well, you've been around a long time. Well, yes, the answer is, that doesn't mean that we're not going to succeed. You've got to remember, Moses never actually got to the promised land, did he? <laughs> but his people most certainly did. So, so just while we're on the economics, income splitting, do you support income splitting? Yeah, I see what they're, what they're aiming, aiming at, and anything to help uh, families uh, we would support. Um, it, it sort of sits there, but uh, that's Mr Dunn's idea, and he's in the government, so why hasn't it happened? Um, I mean, I, I support, a, I believed in a gold card that secured all people's incomes at 66%, that gave them free medicine, uh, I'm sorry, uh, hearing aid support and a whole lot of benefits like rates and reductions and free travel and I wasn't even, wasn't even in the government but I got that didn't I and a lot of other things like free medicine for under six year olds all those things are critical for families uh, our policy was to take it to every child at primary school the national party has jumped that policy I'm pleased to say uh, it's going to introduce it shortly after the election but there's, but there's no sin rather there's you know, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. Now they're going to call it their policy. But we brought that in. So my father can get free hearing aids? No, not free. We'll, we'll heavily oh. su we subsidise them $500 an ear. Okay. He's only got two. <laughs> um. Yeah, but usually, it's not usual that both ears are gone, right? <laughs> well, ask, ask my mother. Um, <laughs> My, my progenitor, actually, it's hate speech <laughs> to say, mother. Um, so paid parental leave, um, you're supporting to six months. Would you see it further? No, we're supporting it to six months, but, and we, all, but we also say, look, you've got to give the uh, employers a break, a break here because it's not easy being an employer. Uh, and we don't see it them versus us. Uh, great societies and great business environments are environments that look after the human capital of the workforce. And so you've got to say, okay, if you're going to have a person off for six months, then that business, for that person, needs a tax break. Otherwise, they're just paying. They've just lost a critical staff member. How do they make up the losses? And that's what a wise parliament and parliamentarians should look at. But you've got them versus us argument, and the employer can afford it. No, the employer frequently, she and he can't afford it, because business is tough. And so we'd give them a tax break to make such relief possible. Do you support the maintaining of the three strikes legislation? Uh, the problem with the three strikes legislation is that nobody, it's not working. It's not working. You know why I don't support the three strikes legislation? Because frequently one strike's enough. One violent offence is enough. I don't think one way wait around for three times that. That's two more victims. Right? Well, that's why we have a tough policy on policing. First of all, we hold the, we're, the, we're the party that, uh, when we were last in power, got a thousand extra policemen, right? Eh? A thousand extra. This is when we had the chance to confidence and supply agreement with Labour in 2005. A thousand extra policemen and women, frontline, and uh, 235 backup support people in the offices. We did that in the space of three years flat. So we need the same number of police per capita as Australia has. That's what we need, and, 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 ins and ensure that the law is enforced. This recent murder out of West Auckland, that f kid had countless offences. Three strikes, he had 40 strikes. Hmm. And what's happening is the police are, are letting people off at the very beginning. Uh, they're giving them a warning. What would usually be a crime is being let off with a warning, and now you've got the Minister of Police saying, crime has fallen. Well, that's nonsense. You change the criteria. Yeah, it looked like it's fallen, but it has not. So on the question of three strikes, no. On the first offence, we want to know what's happening. And that's why our, their law is to ensure that they, they're caught, B, that they're punished, and that there are short, sharp sentences to turn that sort of law breaking around. So it seems in principle you support the concept of three strikes, but you'd prefer it to be called one strike legislation. Well, we'd, we want an appropriate response for the offence. Why would you have it happen, happen three times? And, for, and allow two more victims to be the certain possibility. 
Why did uh, loan sharks? Why did New Zealand first oppose the loan shark bill just passed? Because again, the people in Parliament don't seem to know what's going on. We wanted to, that the bill should put a, an interest cap in the legislation. Otherwise, how's it going to work? So you can charge 26 per cent, 46 per cent, 60 per cent. The bill still allows that. So this bill is not going to work. So you and posted we, just on the interest cap. And we cap said, rate. if you don't put a cap on it, your bill's going to be useless. Mm. They decided that bill would be useless. They've got no cap on it. So you can still lend any, you can lend at 3,000 per cent. And I think that's the same basis that you oppose the uh, uh, gaming, the ga gambling harm reduction bill that Te Urua or Flavel put up. For the same reason, wasn't it? For the same reason. Uh, you know, what, what he did was he said, I want this bill, I'm going to do this, that and everything. The National Party, who, in whom, uh, with whom he's in concert, so um, minimalised or masculated the legislation that what was his 42% target ended up 3%. Now, what difference is that going to make? Hmm. He started out with 42%. You have a look at it. So, I mean, some people would say, Look, the legislation isn't perfect, didn't have the interest cap rate, um, didn't have the gambling harm reduction pool, bill was watered down, but it's still a step in the right direction. At least it starts to target loan sharks, at least it starts to get the sinking lid policy. Does no, it, it achieve it, anything by opposing yeah, them both? Well, first of all, it doesn't target loan sharks though. Why do we call them loan sharks? Because they charge usurious interest rates. Mm. They charge appalling mm. interest rates. If you don't attack that, why are you touching them at all? Because you're trying to fight with your, uh, against uh, a public evil with your hands tied behind your back. So that's why we did that on the interest on the loan sharks, and on the gambling thing. Uh, whilst Mr. Tura Raw Raw was supporting that, he was allowing the National Party to give Sky City an extra 500 pokies. I mean, that's an appalling situation, and a corrupt institution like Sky City. Uh, gets a convention with a public benefit, that is the extra pokies, of $42 million each and every year rising because of those extra pokies. Now, there isn't anybody in this country who couldn't build a convention centre with $42 million subsidy every year. But they got it, a foreign-owned institution. I say the government's corrupt on this matter, and that's what we said at the time, we still say it. The Easter trading, um, I had a look at your voting record on uh, shops being open for Easter, you seem to have a mixed voting record. No, sometimes. we don't. No, we don't. We have quite the opposite. New Zealand First has submitted a number of times a bill that was be that's been voted down, but a bill that said this matter should be taken out of the hands of Parliament, this matter should be put in the hands of the local government, that's the local body, in concert with its ratepayers. That's the stand we take. The local government should decide in concert with its ratepayers. So. The local government has a referendum amongst its local ratepayers, and they can decide. We don't want the issue decided in Parliament because it's an absolute Mickey Mouse outcome at the present time. Has there, has there ever been mention of um, doing the same to Anzac Day or Christmas Day that you know of? But they always seem to target Easter, but not Anzac Day. Or um, it, 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 it's a very good question. That um, I don't know why we've been so. Why uh, Parliament has been that way? about uh, Easter, you see, it, it crept up on us some time ago when we went with Saturday trading. Mm. You know, it, 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 I can, it never rose in the old days because no one ever contemplated it. Mm. Then along comes Saturday trading, now Sunday, now 24-7 trading, and it's become a serious issue. Mm. That, but it's our bill that we have consistently voted only that way. Mm. You said we had a rather patchy record, I was rather concerned about that. Well, it was just mixed because I think what you've been doing is you've been voting for bills that give local communities authority and you've been opposing bills that give a blanket across the nation. I think that's what it is. That's right. Mm. That, but it, but we were the one that initiated mm. the principle that local governments in concert with its ratepayers should make these decisions and that's still our policy. Okay. Um, we're just about there. Just in terms of broadcasting standards, billboard advertising, uh, we've had a session this morning on the sexualisation of kids in the yeah, media. Yeah. Does that concern you? It seriously does. Uh, a lot of it's offensive for a start, uh, and there should be far better public standards than that. So how do we get that? I mean, is it you've got to legislate for it, and you've got to have a body uh, that uh, to which complaints can be made, a body that mirrors the view of society, not their own narrow view, mm. which 
frequently too often happens. Yeah. Just, um, just the, the last one, just welfare. Um, we are in, the, in the value your vote um, resource, which we did in 2011 we're doing this year, we asked, do you support or oppose changes in welfare payments to include vouchers, which limit spending on booze, drugs, tobacco, gambling, and other expenses? Your response was, we will not restore the integrity of the welfare state with a voucher system. Can you just clarify that comment? Say again what I said. <laughs> I didn't say that. We will not restore the integrity of the welfare state with a voucher system. So you'd, no, you no, would prefer we, not to have vouchers? Can I have a look at that? Because that's the use of the word restore. I don't think that I would have said okay, that. Okay, well I might have misread your... No, well, I, would have, I, would have, I would have said the very reverse. We will not, we will not destroy... Destroy the integrity? Yes, we will not, I will not destroy the integrity of the welfare state with a voucher system. And by that I mean, uh, I, mean I believe in the welfare state when a welfare state is based on genuine and deserving need, right? And uh, I think there's a place for it. And, and I think great societies do have a, a, a support mechanism, a safety net for people that are in, that are in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the problem with the <coughs> voucher system is uh, you can transfer vouchers just down the road. So you give me a $100 voucher. I go down and flog it off to Mary. She gives me $100. Now I'm down buying liquor. Uh, this, will, this, in my view, will not work. You recall when the Labour Party, way back in 1938, first paid the family benefit, and they were made up of practical men back in those days, in the main, and, and the, the odd, there wasn't very many women in Parliament. I think Mabel Howard was the first one that got in from their side. But back then, they gave it to who? They gave it to the mother. Because they knew at least that she could be trusted. Right? And they were right. They were right. Now, that is still the case today, and so I would rather focus on, say, to parents, we're going to give you the support, but you're now in a social contract with the state, and you will deliver a certain outcome to us. Mm. And if you don't, like France, we will suspend your benefit and, direct, and deal with the child directly. We are not going to go on abusing, having you abuse your child, and you abuse the taxpayer at the same time. Now, France is hardly a right-wing country, is it? Mm. People say it's socialist, but that's, that, that's what they do. You don't look after your child, bang, here comes the benefit off you. Mm. Because you, you, you're getting money on false pretenses anyway. Mm. And we're far more inclined to that approach. Just finally, it, people may be considering a vote for New Zealand first, but they want to know, is a, a vote for New Zealand first a vote for a national-led government or a Labour-led government? Are you able to say which? which? Are you willing to say? We are 11 weeks from the election. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well now I'm going to talk to you. Do you know all the policies of all the parties at this point in time? No, nor do I. And I think we are entitled to have an election, and I'm entitled to hear what you think about it before we rush off and organise the outcome before you even vote. I happen to believe in democracy, and this party for 21 years is the only party that's never done a deal with any other party, ever. We're not going to start now. I've seen all the coattailing, the scheming and the plotting and I'll give you a ladder to climb the wall and get past 5%. My party says if we can't crack 5%, then we don't deserve to be there. And we, and we think the rest should have the courage of their moral, morality and their beliefs and say the same. I think it's despicable that people want to go to Parliament who can't actually get a decent hall full of people who want to vote for them. Where's the market demand? I mean, if I was selling Simpson washing machines, and only 2% wanted it, I think I'd go and get a new washing machine somewhere else, wouldn't you? Uh, in our case, we are saying we are a legitimate party. We've never compromised. We've probably taken more criticism from the media than every other political party put together. Why? Because we have never cowed, to the, uh, cowed towed down to them. We have never taken their criticism without uh, reacting to it. When we say that we believe, for example, that Immigration should be people that we need, not people who need us. We say that people who get training and education and skills and jobs should be New Zealanders first. We mean it. Now, we've taken a lot of criticism on those matters, but again, we've stuck our ground and time will see us right. Now, you want us to go, to make a decision to go with one or other party now. I haven't heard what they're going to do, what they're going to say, what policies they might unearth in the next few weeks and the next uh, two and a half months. And until I do, 
I still have an, one other further obligation, and that is, we are a democratic party where you would be foolish not to ensure every member of your caucus and senior officials and board of New Zealand First had the say. Because if they're not bound to the outcome, why should they stick to it? That's our point. Um, now, I could go one step further and say, you know, uh, would you buy a car without seeing it? Well, I wouldn't. Wouldn't buy a horse in particular without seeing it. Uh, as someone who comes up a farm or a cow. Um, and that being the case, I can make some certain predictions very, very clear. We are not going to go with race-based parties after the election. We believe in one franchise. Uh, New Zealand First has a lot of Maori members and Pacific Island other members, but we're all there, man, woman, whatever background, putting the country first and calling ourselves New Zealand First. So we're not going to go with that sort of ethnic setup, which we think is so destructive to New Zealand's long-term future. Uh, we are not going to go with two flags and the Treaty of Waitangi approach, which National and Labor and all the rest are happy to go along with, which says that on a contest between our law and uh, the Treaty of Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi will prevail. Look at the Green Party Constitution, look at the Maori Party Constitution, and look what the National Party has done by allowing them to go off to the United Nations, recognise the United Nations Charter on Indigenous Rights, which says, in a contest between the government of this country or the Maori people, the Maori view will prevail. That's what that Charter said. As Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, I would not sign it. I persuaded Helen Clark not to sign it as well. Then along comes National, and they sign it. Now, that'll be a shock to a lot of you National Party people, won't it? But I hope you know in the next 11 months what they have done. But on that score, we're not going to compromise. So in the end, we're going to campaign as hard as we can to get our share of the vote. We believe we will do very well in this election for a lot of reasons. And it is uh, our view that we want to uh, not be, just be in power. If we have to keep the system honest, yet get policy change, we're prepared to go to the cross benches and do just that. No other party will tell you that. But I make that commitment. In 2011 I said that and I meant it and I still do. So it means that if we are in negotiations, we are not going to sell our supporters down the drain. So just to clarify, that was a party political broadcast from the New Zealand First Party. <laughs> well done, Sir Winston Peters. Thank you very much.